Hello everyone. When I was in kindergarten, moms would encourage us to play with kids who had chicken pox. The idea was to get infected as soon as possible and be done with it, so that you get lifelong immunity and don't get sick afterwards in adulthood. Was this a smart thing to do and what should we do today? Well, I know that infecting kids with chicken pox on purpose might seem a little bit brutal, but you have to remember that there was no vaccine back then. So chicken pox was basically unavoidable. It was just one of these diseases that everyone would catch eventually. And it really is better to get infected as a child than later in life, because chicken pox tends to be more severe in adults. About 1 in 400 adults with chicken pox or varicella will get varicella pneumonia, a life-threatening complication. Now, I I know that this number might not seem that high at first, but when you take into account that everyone will eventually get infected, you realize it is quite significant. So how should this affect our approach to the treatment of varicella or chicken pox in adults? How can we prevent it? And what if our patient was already exposed to someone who is sick? Can we prevent them from getting sick? Well, in some countries like the United States, for example, vaccination against varicella has been routine for the past couple of decades. After two doses, it's highly effective in preventing symptoms and it's almost 100% effective in preventing severe complications. In other countries like Croatia, vaccination still isn't routine, but the vaccine is available. Now, regarding the treatment of varicella, as opposed to children, all adults and teenagers, so everyone older than 12, should be routinely treated with antivirals. You will mainly be able to choose between acyclovir and valacyclovir. The latter is somewhat more convenient because the patient has to take it three times instead of five times a day, but with either drug the duration of treatment is seven days. And make sure that you start treatment as soon as possible preferably within the first 24 hours since the first appearance of the rash. But even later, if the rash has not fully crossed it yet, it still makes sense to start treatment. But once all the lesions on the skin have turned into crusts, in uncomplicated varicella, oral treatment with acyclovir won't make much difference. So, start treatment with oral antivirals as soon as possible. With timely treatment, serious complications are highly unlikely. That being said, there will be scenarios where oral antivirals simply won't be enough. In textbooks you will see that varicella can cause all sorts of life-threatening complications like encephalitis, hepatitis, transverse myelitis, myocarditis, but in reality these complications are very, very uncommon. Personally, I've never seen an immunocompetent patient with any of these complications. Your main concern will be varicella pneumonia, and this is quite common. Again, 1 in 400 patients will get varicella pneumonia, and this is a very severe disease. What it means for you in practice is that if your adult patient with varicella presents with shortness of breath or dry cough, of course, you will suspect pneumonia, you will do a chest x-ray, and if you have a reason to believe that this really is pneumonia, you should admit your patient and start intravenous antivirals. So, oral antivirals might not be enough. Because when dyspnea sets in, it can rapidly progress into respiratory failure, so your patient might end up in the ICU within a day or two. So, naturally, you have to hospitalize all patients with varicella pneumonia. Now, regarding these other uncommon complications, if you see a patient with varicella and signs of encephalitis or hepatitis, it's time to stop and think. Ask yourself, why would this happen to this patient? Is my patient perhaps immunocompromised? Are they an organ transplant recipient? Or are they on any kind of immunosuppressants or corticosteroids? Do they perhaps have HIV? Do your best to find an explanation for this extremely rare complication. For these patients, of course, oral drugs will not be enough. You will hospitalize them and start intravenous treatment. Now, looking in the opposite direction, let's suppose that you already know that your patient is immunocompromised and they present with chickenpox, but as far as you can see, there are no signs of complications yet. Again, you should hospitalize this patient and start intravenous antivirals, precisely because immunocompromised patients are so vulnerable to the complications of varicella. So even if they look okay, even if you can see no signs of complications, you should still hospitalize them. Now, of course, immunocompromised is a very broad term. Not every type of immunosuppression or immunodeficiency is the same. There are different levels and different types. 
Regardless, it's better to overdo it a little bit with immunocompromised patients than to underestimate the severity of their condition. And in the end, the most common complication of varicella that is not directly caused by the virus is cellulitis. This typical rash in varicella tends to be itchy so people scratch it and they introduce bacteria into the skin, which can of course lead to cellulitis and sometimes even more invasive infections. So whenever you have a patient with varicella, take a close look at their rash and look for signs of skin infection and treat them accordingly. So much for patients who already have symptoms. But what can we do if our patient was exposed to someone with varicella? Can we prevent them from getting sick? Yes, we can and we should, because varicella zoster is one of the most contagious viruses around. After a close contact with an infected person, the probability of infection is greater than 90%. And the period of infectivity starts about two days before the appearance of the rash, so right about the time when the prodromal symptoms start, all the way until all lesions on the skin have turned into crust. So basically the period of infectivity is around eight days. Now, People who are immunocompetent and they have immunity against varicella, either from a previous infection or vaccination with two doses, don't need any kind of post-exposure prophylaxis because they are fully protected. But people with no evidence of immunity need one of the following options. In healthy immunocompetent patients who don't have evidence of immunity against varicella, again, either from previous infection or vaccination, we can simply use the varicella vaccine. The vaccine should be administered within five days after exposure. This will give enough time for the immune system to build immunity and prevent the development of symptoms. This method is highly effective. It's about 80% effective in preventing clinical illness and almost 100% effective in preventing severe complications. Even the people who do get sick will typically have very mild symptoms. So again, this will work for immunocompetent patients. Why do I keep emphasizing immunocompetent? Well, simply because this is a live attenuated vaccine, which means we cannot use it in immunocompromised individuals and pregnant women. For them, we can use passive immunoprophylaxis or varicella zoster immune globulin. This is important because varicella tends to be more severe in pregnancy, the probability of complications is higher, and it can lead to congenital abnormalities. So it poses danger for both the mother and the fetus. Naturally, regardless of post-exposure prophylaxis, if your patient eventually does develop symptoms, of course, you will still treat them with acyclovir, which leads me to the final option for post-exposure prophylaxis. Acyclovir or velocyclovir, again, antivirals. If the two aforementioned methods for post-exposure prophylaxis are either not feasible or not available, you can use post-exposure prophylaxis with antivirals. You will use the same dosing and the same duration as you would in the treatment of varicella, only you will start antivirals in the second week of the incubation period while the patient still has absolutely no symptoms. Now this method of post-exposure prophylaxis is not that well researched and supported by data as the other two, but I would like you to know about all of these options because I've seen a lot of patients with varicella who ended up in the ICU on mechanical ventilators with all sorts of complications because they didn't receive post-exposure prophylaxis or even treatment in time. So the next time you see a patient who you think might need post-exposure prophylaxis, you will know what options are out there. You will be able to consult a specialist and react in time. If you want to know more about this topic, take a look at the description of the video. You will find the list of research articles that I found most useful. Chickenpox in adults is something that you will see eventually if you work long enough in primary care or acute care. But the same virus causes something that is way more common than chickenpox and that is, of course, herpes zoster or shingles. Here is a link to my video where you will learn all about it. Thank you for watching, good luck out there and take care.